Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 25th episode of This Week in Cloud Computing. I am your host, Amanda Kulong, and I am joined via Skype by Dave Linthicum, my trusty co-host. How are you doing there, Dave? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing out there? <laughs> Wonderful, but I'm all alone in studio. Well, kind of alone in studio, except that I'm going to call this Storm On Demand guy my Mark Jeffrey doll. So I know Mark's watching in the chat room, you know, our trusty CEO. He thinks that because, you know, this is our 25th episode, we've grown up and we don't need him in here, but I have my Mark doll and I have a pen. So voodoo doll, look out, Mark. Don't say anything too mean in that chat room. Looks just so. like it. <laughs> there you go. Lots of good stuff on the docket today. Uh, some quick network updates. I'm really happy to, to tell you that uh, This Week in Cloud Computing was named as a recommended podcast for cloud computing by Read Write Web. And Dave, I think one of yours was on there as well, was it not? Yeah, yeah my, both the podcasts are up yeah. there. Yeah, you're Mr. So, hey. Popularity over there. I mean, <laughs> you know, you're our pot of gold. I mean, this is great. We all are. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you guys check that out and see the list there. Um, if you go to This Weekend on iTunes, you might see this mug. I'm just saying. If you look for a cloud computing you know, on iTunes, you, you might see something familiar. I'm not saying you're going to like it. You just might see something familiar. Um, this Friday at 11 o'clock, we actually have a special edition of This Week in Startups with Jason. So make sure you tune into that this Friday only, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Um, we've got some great guests joining us today. On the phone right now, I have James Waters. He's the Senior Manager of Business Development for vCloud at VMware. How are you doing today, James? Hey, what's up? <laughs> Very well. What's up? Nice to have you. And then later on in the show for our app of the week, we have Josh Stageberg, Director of Engineering, joining us from Live Office. So stay tuned for that. That will happen about at the half hour mark. And if you'd like to participate with us, join us here in the chat room. You can also follow us on Twitter at TWICloudComp and use the hashtag TWICC so I can follow those tweets. And pitches, that sort of thing, send them to me, Amanda, at thisweekend.com. I always get back to you guys and rate our show. Please, please rate our shows. Um, we've got some wonderful sponsors. This Week in Cloud Computing is brought to you by Verticore, Storm On Demand, and NetDNA. You can follow those guys at Verticore, that's V-I-R-T-A-C-O-R-E, at Storm On Demand and at NetDNA CDN. They make the show possible, and we have fun with our sponsors, as you've probably seen. Or if you're new here at This Week in Cloud Computing, you'll see pretty soon. Um, Events and awards, mentioned last week, the UP Cloud Computing Conference is November 15th through the 19th in San Francisco. There are also cloud awards associated with that. The deadline is September 30th, so I will make sure to get those links in the post, the blog post after the show for you. I believe there's also some kind of show associated with VMware, is there not, James, coming up? Um, yeah, I think we <laughs> might have one later this month. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, before we jump into any of that, I would like to talk about some news. All right, top of the hour we've got, well, not top of the hour, actually, because we're 3.30. Uh, we've got Box.net talking about updating their iPhone and iPad apps to sync files for offline access. Now, this seems like a pretty straightforward story, but it's something I actually think about a lot with the cloud in terms of, you know, it's, it's great that we can have everything in the cloud and access everything in the cloud, but especially a lot of you iPhone people, you complain about at and service and the edge network and not being able to get access, and what happens if you've got that mission critical thing that you're trying to get access to and and you can't. So Box.net, at least on their side, is syncing things up so that you can actually have certain information on your phone or on your iPad um, so that you can have offline access to it. I just think this is a no-brainer, but um, is this something we'll start seeing more with cloud apps? Dave. Yeah, I think what they're doing basically is providing the ability to have storage on your device so you can carry with you on airplanes and places where there's no connectivity. So, and this is a step in the right direction. And, you know, guys like Evernote and, and other folks are, are moving in this direction or already have moved in this direction as well. And it's very convenient because one of the things I love to do is to load up documents on my iPad when I get on an airplane. And that's when I do all my reading. And mm -hmm. if I have to wait to be connected, I won't be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of Evernote, by the way, everyone, Evernote will be our app of the week next week. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, James, do you have any thoughts on this one? Offline access, the importance with the cloud? 
Yeah, I mean, I think some people think of cloud as uh, the return of the dumb terminal area yeah. era, and that's one I've been kind of trying to shoot down as long as I've been talking about it because there's a fair amount of power that still exists in your handheld and your iPad devices. It's just, uh, you know, so I think this is an example that there's going to be kind of a bifurcation. You're going to have power at the edge on mobile and then power in the data center. Yeah. Okay. By the way, love that headshot. Everybody see how happy he is? James is, you know, big, huge, <laughs> smiley face. It just makes me want to... <sighs> Anyway, side note, um, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, Rackspace News, they've expanded their cloud servers offering to Microsoft Windows and .NET, but strangely, they're not including Azure in that. And they're also, at this point, not supporting Amazon EC2. So no surprise also here that the company that Rackspace is doing really well with its cloud revenue, they just announced you know, huge margins in Q2. They've added about 8,510 customers, I think, launched the OpenStack project. But why aren't they offering support for Azure when they're looking at Microsoft Windows and .NET? I want to throw this one to you first, James. Uh, you know, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a tough call. I think, yeah. uh, you know, I think Azure has had an interesting ramp in the market, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not, you know, we got it, I got an, I was an Azure demo user, and I got an interesting email from their product manager saying, hey, can you tell us why you left and why you're right. not using us more, and we kind of have a form email, and I think, mm -hmm. I think Azure is still sort of finding its place in the market, you know, hats off to Microsoft for making a huge bet, huge investment there. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that there's a ton of room for, you know, sort of ancillary service providers to even compete with them. Hmm. They've sort of said, we're going to spend a billion dollars in data centers, so what's the motivation for a service provider to say, hey, we'll go head to head with someone who's got that cost of capital? True, true, really good point. Dave, what are your opinion, what's your opinion on this one? I agree. I agree. Um, ultimately, Microsoft, Azure is Microsoft's play. I don't think it's going to make sense for Rackspace to offer Azure. Uh, EC2, um, those sorts of services, those are, those are already part of Rackspace. I think Rackspace would cons consider themselves a competitor to Amazon and that sort of thing. I think it's yeah. a step in the right direction because people you know, like to use LAMP stacks and part of the cloud stack, but there's a lot of Microsoft users out there. They provide an on-demand Microsoft stack out of their cloud, and, and that's a good evolutionary move for them. Fair point. And what do you think, Mark? What was that? You're, you're, you're not on the show? What? Oh, so sad. Oh, he has no voice anymore. Hmm. <laughs> there he goes. Um, Akamai and Bright Cove have partnered on a bundled internet service um, to offer HD video in the cloud. Um, quite a, to me, this is quite a testament to you know just the overall adoption of online video and high def video online specifically. Um, HD video is going to be delivered over Akamai's CDN um, using Bright, Go Bright Cove's online media platform. And Bright Cove, by the way, previously used um, Limelight, so I'm curious why the, why the switch there. But uh, a number of questions around this story. You know, where does CDN CDNs specifically fit in the rush to cloud services? Uh, will we see an uptick from enterprises using video now? Um, and do you think that the movement of gaming and now HD video to the cloud will further heat up the discussion around net neutrality? James. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting topic because yeah. when you think about the power of cloud computing in terms of infrastructure as a service, it's not always to deliver static content or a static right. file like a video is. I mean, Akamai has been around since 98. You know, mm -hmm. they've been a hot company for a long time back yeah. then for delivering static content. I think the interesting thing about cloud really is the ability to deliver dynamic, um, analytic, or complex content mm -hmm. on demand in a compute intensive way versus just a, a basic resource intensive way. So, okay. you know, I think it's, it's really great to see that we're moving to an on-demand model for all of media, but mm -hmm. I think the interesting and complex part of the computing equation continues to be in the dynamic content. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with you on that one. But wouldn't CDNs be really good for that? I think CDNs are great for static content, mm -hmm. and the power behind a CDN is the algorithm that populates the different nodes with that same static content across right. 16,000 different pops. Yeah. Um, they're not really good if you throw a Hadoop job at them. So uh, <laughs> don't try that in action. <laughs> Very good one. And what do you think on the, about this one, Dave? Yeah, this is about frequently delivering the same thing over and over again. That's what Alchemy does very well, and they've been doing that for a long period of time. have turned it into a science. I think this is a good partnership, and this is going to deliver some good, some good value in the network. And Alchemy will be able to do replication of core binary services into their network and basically provide uh, you know, better performance in serving up these HD videos. Um, but, yeah, as far as the big moves goes, eh, I, I, I don't view this as, as uh, that big of a deal right now. Mm -hmm. And why do you mm -hmm. think they switched from Limelight? Just as a side note. 
Uh, I'm not sure why they switch from line light. Mm. I think that ultimately, you know, this is about providing the video content, uh, the uh, content management system around the video stuff to, right. you know, that's most popular in Bright, and uh, and they're there. Bright Cove, mm -hmm. Bright Cove has a has the audience. True, true, fair enough. Um, we've got another one on here. Let's see, where is our Dave article? Did you get rid of our Dave article? No, here it is. Have to call out the Dave article. It's just it's just fair. Um, you say, Dave, why you say why you're not ready to create a private cloud? Um, you, you agree with Forrester Research's James Statton, who is saying that most IT pros that are hot on cloud computing think that they can simply create an internal private cloud. But the problem is, and I'll quote James Statton here: He says, "Cloud solutions aren't a thing; they're a how." And most enterprise INO shops lack the experience and maturity to manage such an environment. So, Dave, why do you agree with him? Because we've said for a long time, and I've said for a long time, that private cloud computing and cloud computing in general is something you do, it's not something you buy. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these enterprises and government agencies are, are driving quickly into these private cloud environments without any kind of architectural forethought and how you configure and deploy these things. And ultimately, I think they're going to fail a lot of the times. They don't in essence understand what a private cloud is, how to architect it, how to implement it, and they're doing traditional IT and they're doing some hybrid of traditional IT. They're calling it a cloud. It's not having the value. And I just see that all over the place right now. And it really comes down to talent. We just mm -hmm. don't have the people out there that are trained in how to architect and deploy these solutions. Mm -hmm. So you think that they're a little bit delusional if they think that they're prepared to do this because it's more of the how. They're very delusional right now, and, and I, I talk to delusional people all the time, and unfortunately, that's like any kind of an overhyped space. Stop talking about me that way, Dave. <laughs> you're going to have a lot of people who are, who are going to overestimate and underachieve on this kind of stuff, and I think right. that's what's happening right now. Right. James, what are your thoughts on this one? Do you think that you know IT folks are, are ready to do this internally, or, or do you agree with Dave and with James Statton? Those are two pretty big names that are saying, nope, can't do this, not ready to do a private cloud. Uh, you know, I'm a software guy, so I'm going to say that what really matters is the maturity of the software stack. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've said for a long time that what makes cloud interesting eventually is that it can just become software. So while it may sure. not be the case that today you can just have Amazon in-house in 10 days, I, I wouldn't suggest that people can do that. Yeah. As you know, portable software stacks continue to evolve and do more and more of the work and handle more and more of the complexity, you know, I, I think that over time it becomes more achievable. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's going to put pricing pressure and execution pressure actually on public cloud providers when you have sure. very large private enterprises that can do their own. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've actually, you know, I actually talked about talked to you this back channel, you know, just rumor mill, a very, very large public commodity cloud computing client I hear just bought a tremendous amount of hardware internally. Hmm. So, you know, I, I thought we weren't going to talk about that. <laughs> I don't think it's the case that somehow there's a magic sauce that just because it's a public service that no one can compete with it. When you get to a yeah. certain scale, you can't compete with it. What David's right about, though, is if you have a, a lethargic, uh, low execution organization, mm -hmm. um, calling something cloud doesn't help you. True. Really good point. That gets into our whole discussion we always have here about cloud washing, too. Um, that's actually a good one too. James, what are your thoughts on cloud washing? Do you, do you feel like a lot of companies are using cloud washing just to say, oh, we have a cloud product? Yeah, I, first thing I always ask them is, okay, great, what's your cloud API for your cloud product? <laughs> and, uh, when they go, oh, well, we don't really have a cloud API, I'm like, well, what do you have? Yeah. Like, oh, we have this scalable thing. And I said, okay, that's cool, good luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, if you, I mean, cloud is, cloud is about APIs, it's about ecosystems. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the vCloud API, I spend a lot of time thinking about that, right. um, dealing with ISVs, integrating into that. So if you're not out there building an ecosystem of integration points and programmatic control, mm -hmm. um, then I believe you are cloud washing. Hmm. There we go. We'll have to make sure that we throw your definition of cloud washing up on the blog. Moving right along, uh, speaking of blogging, uh, George Reese in a blog on O'Reilly outlines the fact that private clouds have much the same security issues as public clouds in some cases. Um, the fact that private clouds exist on premises could on premise could be leading many into a false sense of security, that big false sense of security. So are those that implement private clouds over public clouds due to security concerns fooling themselves in some instances, Dave? 
They certainly are. I mean, he's absolutely right. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. everybody wants to use, they, they love the idea of cloud computing. They just don't like the idea of putting on a public cloud. So they choose private clouds, and right. then they implement private clouds because they think they're getting better security. The reality mm -hmm. is, is that security models around private cloud computing and security models around public cloud computing are really a factor of the architect and the technology that goes into implementing it. And I see a lot of private clouds that are very unsecure, probably a lot more unsecure than public cloud offerings. And that seems to be the trend these days. Yeah. And uh, you know, kudos to George for pointing it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you do? You agree with this one too, James? You know, I think you know. If you remember the way I look at the world, is it's about having a portable software stack that you can implement right. publicly or privately. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more about do you have the option to negotiate with your public provider? So I think part True. of people's problem with the public cloud security is, is that it's a take it or leave it offer. Yeah. And uh, I think when they look at private cloud, they say, hey, we, we no longer have that take it or leave it. I think David's right that, you know, public cloud providers can get to a scale of security, you know, expertise that mm -hmm. some small companies can't match. Mm -hmm. And there's virtue to that. At the same time, it's nice to be able to have a private cloud sometimes and be able to dictate the exact terms you want if necessary. Right. And I'd say in the future, you'll have the opportunity to go to any service provider you want if that stack's portable and get them to execute it for you. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know we're kind of in a barbell situation now, and I think as more software yeah. comes to market, you'll have more choice. Yeah, no, I would agree. Right. Um, and Just it also point. gets down to you know one thing we've talked about here on the show before is like the bit of customization to the issues that that are around that, and also looking what the Cloud Security Alliance is up to. So we're going to keep our eyes and ears open for that. Well, without further ado, I'm starting to feel kind of weird, like I'm being thrown back in time or something. And what? Shield Maiden. Yes. Ragnarok is upon us once again. What's that? Oh, never mind. Just go with it. Okay. Storm! Storm on demand! Storm on demand! Storm on demand is an infrastructure as a service, a cloud computing platform that is powerful enough, powerful enough to replace dedicated servers. A proprietary cloud platform designed by Liquid Web, one of the largest web hosting providers with over 12 years of experience. It is easier to use and less expensive than Amazon EC2. Features include server setup in minutes, easy scaling, backup and restoration capabilities, and pay-as-you-go utility-style billing. Options include cPanel, Fantastico, Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, fully managed servers, private networking, and swords like this, and little guys that we do not have in this commercial, but it doesn't matter, because this is cooler. Storm On Demand can be found at stormondemand.com at Storm On Demand. Ragnarok be damned. Storm on demand. If you do not get storm on demand, I will come to your house with my sword and make you get it. What? Oh, sorry. M Mark has a stomachache. So, sorry, sorry. Put, put you down there. All right, let's get into a discussion now with James. Again, we have James Waters, for those of you that are just joining us. He's the Senior Manager of Business Development for vCloud at VMware. Um, and let's get, you know, this is again, This Week in Cloud Computing, so if you're just now joining us. Um, James, you've also done a lot of stuff um, in the Bay Area, a, a community group around the, around the cloud as well, a cloud club, so to speak. Um, and you've also, <laughs> what? Yeah, I have, yeah, I used to do that, yeah. <laughs> Um, and you've also done some stuff in with the open source space as well. I just wanted to throw that out there. I know you from a previous life. So um, yeah. I want to start off with a discussion around what the cloud is not. Um, you know, everyone that I get on the show seems to have a specific opinion about this. You kind of mentioned your definition of cloud washing. Um, does virtualization equal cloud computing? That's the biggest one, given that, you know, we're looking here at VMware. Um, you know, I think that, uh there's, there's a lot of ways of attacking that one. It's a, it's a popular topic. Yeah. I would say that in my experience with it, this is maybe not to speak um, definitively, mm -hmm. but cloud computing, you, you don't want as many options sometimes. You want to be able to pick you know, the three or four or five points of control you want and go with it, and you want to simplify your options um, in, in some cases. And virtualization at a data center level, you have incredible granular control how, over exactly how you want to configure things. And mm -hmm. you can have experts that configure it exactly for your application. And right. I think inherent in the bargain of cloud computing is that you've, you've somewhat standardized and industrialized those component inputs. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people try to pit those two against each other, it's not that they're one is necessary or sufficient. It's, it's more that in cloud, you're doing a bit of a simplification so that you can programmatically request things 
um, directly and efficiently without having to specify uh, too much of the exact um, right. the exact configuration. Yeah. Does that uh, make sense? Yeah, no, I think so. Dave, Dave do you um, have any points specifically to this one? Yeah, I think it's. I, I think I agree. I mean, it's. It's ultimately it's about the dynamic allocation of resources in a shareable way, and it, that's really kind of the essence of cloud computing: the ability to provision right. resources as you need to provision resources to support whatever kind of application you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. So the notion of cloud computing as being just virtualization, I really don't agree with that, and I don't think that's what we're saying here. Ultimately, it's about multi-tenancy. It's about auto provisioning. It's about use-based accounting. It's about you know identity management-based security. It's about it's about granular governance. It's about all these things which really make this a durable platform. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I want to jump back for a second to the notion of security. Um, you know, we just talked about it within the private cloud versus public, but a lot of people used to use security specifically as the reason for not going to the cloud at all. Is there any valid excuse anymore for not going to the cloud? You know, if, if it makes sense for your business. Let's leave it, at, you know, at that. Why don't you, James? I, I think there's overwhelming reasons that people don't put everything that they have in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's my yeah. job to build public cloud here, and I'm a big fan of public cloud. It's my yeah. living. It's my business. But <laughs> I'll be the first to tell you that at certain scale, it just doesn't make sense yet. Right. And if you looked at, you know, uh, and at certain security controls, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's there's a lot of reasons to think that cloud has a very bright future. But uh, as an overall IT spending percentage, I know Chris Hoff Beaker, uh, very mm -hmm. eloquent about this. He's been that, on the show know, before. It's still mice nuts. Yeah. And so let's give it lots of credit for the the future it has and uh, mm -hmm. um, where it's headed. But I think that the overall the overall market hasn't swung to it yet. I think the market's right. very curious about it. So I would never say that there's cases where you don't have a reason to, to not go to cloud. I think mm -hmm. it's actually, actually it's more interesting to look at people who are finding ways of where they can use what is available today to, to, to augment their business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely agree with you on that one. Um, in your experience then at VMware, um, what, what are the instances that make the most sense for going to a public cloud? Sure, I mean, I think that the, the most exciting thing for um, companies is when they're doing anything that's dynamic mm -hmm. and is not sort of long-term installation of an application that's persistent. Okay. So I think cloud has yet to prove itself as the place to put long-lived, persistent, permanent things. Mm -hmm. I think that'll come, but I don't think that it's, you know, 100% there yet. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think therefore, you know, dev test is a classic one. I mean, IBM yeah. released a study that 50% of some server, some company's server capacity is just for developing and testing new applications versus hosting them permanently. Mm -hmm. that, that's a huge one and one that's been talked about, but I'm starting to see like RFPs and POs for large scale outsourcing of that environment. Mm -hmm. That's going to mean real money and it's not going to be onesie twosie developers. It's going right. to be enterprises with 4,000 systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of the enterprise play, you've got a lot of people that are jumping into that. Um, where, where do you see the, 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 the biggest people taking off? Like, where, where do you see the front runner coming out? Is, is there something that's going to cause that? Or who, who do you see as, as the front runner right now? I think that, you know, like I said, that the software stack is not perfectly mature yet. I yeah. mean, I have. So it's still to too early to tell, in other words. Yeah, I think yeah. that there's interesting things coming. And I mm -hmm. think that. People who forget that cloud's going to be an evolving feature set in terms of software are, mm -hmm. are overlooking it. Yes, it's about simplification, but it's also yeah. about what else you can offer. So right. I'd say that the enterprise cloud story is really going to start to take shape in 2011 as more offerings come to market. Okay. All right. And uh, I think that's going to be pretty disruptive to the current thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll look back on 2010 and be like, oh, wow, we didn't see that coming. Yeah, exactly. Dave, what are your thoughts on this one, too, in terms of just the enterprise play overall? Do you, do you agree with the same time frame, roughly, in terms of when it's going to take off? Yeah, I do. I do. I think mm -hmm. 2011, I've always stated that as being the inflection point for this technology, yeah. and I think, and I stick to that. I think the reality is, is that people are going to see the value and how this stuff works and they're going to get some use cases and get some core um, and core applications that are right for cloud computing. I mean, James made a great point earlier. Is ultimately there's lots of things that belong in the cloud and lots of things that don't belong in the cloud. We're going to figure out what belongs in the cloud by 2011, by the end of next yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, and Amanda, don't forget just a, a quick point. Sure. That don't forget sometimes these enterprises who are buying like data center space today mm -hmm. are doing so with 300-page RFPs. 
True. And I think sometimes when you, you say, oh, well, it's just all going to come down to this vanilla commodity. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to give up that 300 pages and all people that have jobs specifying yeah. that. It's going to be an evolution. Yeah. No, I definitely agree. It's definitely a process. And we've seen that even here on the show just since we've started. You know, the, we're in episode 25 now of This Week in Cloud Computing, and we've seen a lot of things just change since, since we've been around. So... Um, not everyone knows about your open source background. I want to throw that out there just a little bit. So what are your thoughts on Rackspace's move in the open source space specifically with the cloud? Sure. So my open source background was working at Sun Microsystems and doing yeah. part of the Open Solaris project there, just to put that out there. Right. Um, I think, you know, I was at OSCON uh, by invitation of Simon Wardley. They did a great job up there. Mm -hmm. They had all the major people. OSCON's and, a great uh, show. Yeah, it was a fun show. Yeah. Uh, I got picked on a little bit. It was good, you know. Kind of <laughs> up there, uh, but you know, everyone wanted to talk about me too. So you can tell that there's there's some competition still out there. When I when I think about open source and cloud right now, I think that there's a there's a lot of VC money that's coming into mm -hmm. um, funding these various cloud stacks. Yep. And the preponderance of that VC money means that they don't have to get revenue right away, and they want to attract attention. And one way that they've been doing that, frankly, is by open sourcing and hoping a community will come. Right. Um, right. I don't know that any of them yet have an overwhelming community, though. I know. So I, I don't, you know, like you can name the top hacker for, you know, Linux stuff, and I think cloud is in an open source framework. It's early days, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of VC money in it right now, but, right. and, you know, good luck to them all, but I think it's, right now, the open source is a bit of, oh, I'm going to get shot for this, a bit of a marketing angle for some of these folks, and mm -hmm. for others, it is a true attempt to build a community. So I think, and I'm staying tuned, but, I don't yeah. think that there's an overwhelming kind of checkmate anywhere close yet. Well, we appreciate you for sharing something that's a little out there on the edge. <laughs> uh, speaking of you know stuff that's out there on the edge a little bit, what are your thoughts ab around what happened with Eli Lilly's fight with Amazon Web Services and contract negotiations? What, what what's your take on all of that? I mean, I just I, I look at it at a high level. I yeah. I wouldn't want to speak to exactly what happened there or mm -hmm. why. And at a high level, again, you know, I'm all about a, a strategy for an enterprise that says it's about a software stack that you can deploy wherever you want to implement your cloud. When yeah. you have that, suddenly you have negotiating power mm -hmm. because you can go to the top three providers and say, I need this special way of doing logging and uh, management of who the base administrator was to pass my specific compliance, and you can get it. Yeah. And again, these are these people that have those 300-page documents when they go to procure things today. And Amazon is pretending like they're selling them a book. Right. And that's causing this incredible dissonance in the enterprise market. And they've tried to hire sort of enterprise marketing manager. I saw them tweeting about yeah, that. Yeah, I saw that too. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit more. And I think that's where I say that there's going to be some people that fill that middle ground and mm -hmm. offer alternatives okay. um, in 2011. And mm -hmm. that'll be interesting how that all shakes out. Yeah, I think so too. We've definitely been paying attention to that. Um, real quick, one of your favorite topics, and I have to read it verbatim just because it makes me laugh, and this is a, you know one of your <laughs> favorites. Should infrastructure and networks suck and just make it up in software? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have an ongoing uh, uh, feud with Simon Wardley about this. Uh -huh. and pretty much, you know, you can take a standpoint that says, you know, uh, you can if you just code correctly, you can make a thousand mice running in wheels into a correct, <laughs> into a you know, an efficient computer. Right. Um, I happen to think that what's really the case is that developer time and high quality developer talent is actually much more scarce than good infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And when you start to say, well, just use high dollar development ways of fixing these problems, I say you want to fix as much as you can in infrastructure and solve as much as you can in infrastructure because human creativity is the most expensive resource in the world. Sure. And so I have a standpoint that I think cloud should be as good as possible and have things like layer two connectivity so you don't have to worry about mm -hmm. you know, uh, security through uh, security in depth or something like that that right. you're impenetrable sitting out there on the web. So th I, I actually take the standpoint that clouds are going to be more and more powerful, that some of the I.O. issues that exist in current clouds have to be fixed or else people are going to have to be doing weird things to scale their apps. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's just an example, and I, I think quality has a place in the cl cloud, and Amazon Absolutely. adopting their sort of cluster compute model yep. was, a huge, which was a huge admission of that because they mm -hmm. said for a class of workload that we have to get better hardware and better networks. You know, my question is, 
why didn't they have that across their whole? Why did they? Mm -hmm. Why did they only put something good in that one particular? That's place? actually a really good point, Dave. Do you? What are your thoughts on his standpoint here in terms of where quality fits with the cloud? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. you have to provide people with platforms to be success. And I think assuming that we're all going to be great engineers and every company is going to be able to hire great engineers and that's going to make successful systems is, again, again delusional. <laughs> so <it's laughs> the word not, of the day. Real, yeah, it's just not real world. And I agree, too. I mean, when Amazon decided, you know, to create this high -end, these high-end cluster computers and sell them, you know, at a different price point, um, mm -hmm. Why isn't that everything in the cloud? Why would I choose mm -hmm. not to buy anything but that? And and it's it's going to take a while before all this kind of bears basically falls out and and, and normalizes yeah. itself. And like I said, we got some we got some breaking in to do with all these clouds out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. James, talk to me for a minute about the evolution of cloud service tiers. So this notion of commodity forever, or will enterprise style options become you know more available? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, we, we talked about the, the distant polls that kind of yeah. happened. And the good thing that Amazon did was they disrupted and they executed. And they said, we can get you mm -hmm. this thing, and we can get it to you fast. Yeah. And, and that fit a certain part of the market for people who are doing lightweight web apps or quick development or very basic tasks. Mm -hmm. And people got really excited about that, and they started to say, well, this may be the future. And I don't actually think that's the case. I think that, like mm -hmm. I've been saying okay. you know, throughout the show, that there's going to be people filling in other tiers so that you can have convenient access to something that looks a little bit more like a traditional data center mm -hmm. um, that isn't what I jokingly refer to as a ghetto, ghetto data center on command. <laughs> um, <laughs> but an actual, you know, uh, something that's a little bit more traditional and uh, performant, uh, network isolated, and something right. that looks like your current data center, but you, you, you request it with an API, and it worked. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what 2011 is going to be all about. Okay. Yeah, I, I like this whole notion of looking ahead to 2011. Um, speaking of looking ahead in terms of next month, uh, VMworld is coming up. So are you doing any panels? Yeah, you know, uh, you yeah. mentioned George Reese. I just had, right. uh, had lunch with him yesterday in Palo Alto here, uh, talking about uh -huh. the panel we're going to do. It's going to be all about how you do enterprise application deployment through the vCloud API and to vCloud services. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the cool things that uh, in Stratus, his company does, mm -hmm. is they allow you to control both public vCloud services and mm. private vSphere all in the same management interface. Oh, okay. And I think that's pretty cool. And I think you're going to see a lot of this during this transition and evolution, mm -hmm. a lot of this hybrid value where it's not about one or the other, but it's a way of managing with a single pane of glass both environments. So that should yeah. be a great panel. Uh, Adrian Cole, uh, J Clouds is on that, okay. as well as uh, Engine Yard, who runs uh, all of their services on a Ruby library called Fog that works between different clouds. Mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Great. Well, we'll definitely get the you know the date and the time for that, and make sure everyone has that as well. Um, is there anything else that you want to you know update us about with VMware overall, or any final thoughts? I just say, uh, don't miss VMworld. Uh, <laughs> I'll be tweeting up a storm uh, at From VMworld. what handle? What's your Twitter handle? Waters James at Twitter, W A T T E R S James. Uh -huh. uh, last name first. Oh, and nice. I will, I've been taking a break on Twitter lately and not saying too much just because I know it's coming. Until uh, you VMworld. saw that I was going to be interviewing you and then you're like, uh oh, I'd better start <laughs> tweeting. <laughs> 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 yeah, Wonderful. Right. Hey, Dave, do you have any final thoughts for James? Yeah, I mean, going forward, you know, as we're, we're evolving the virtualization environment and the lines, to your point, we're getting to these hybrid cloud environments where we're getting to these common API systems that goes across on-premises systems and also on the cloud. Do you think that's going to continue to evolve? And ultimately, what's VMware's take on that and how are they going to provide technology to facilitate that going forward? Yeah. Great. Well, again, everyone, make sure that you're following James Waters on Twitter. It's actually Waters James, W-A-T-T-E-R-S, James. And thank you so much for joining us today, James. We'll definitely drag you back on if you're not scared to uh, chat with me again. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It was fun. Nice talking to you guys. Thanks so much. So again, James Waters, VMware, and um, I believe it's time for a musical interlude. Out ocean provider letting you down. Take a look at managed private clouds from Verticor. They can easily replace your current IT infrastructure and eliminate IT pains. Or the cost and hassle of buying and maintaining IT equipment and software. Deliver 100% uptime to end users. 
Couldn't figure and deploy resources in minutes. With Verticor, oh Verticor, you should be using Verticor. Verticor, oh Verticor, you should be using Verticor. Verticor, your private cloud is hosted in an advanced and secure data center. Uses only best in class hardware and software and gives you access to scalable bandwidth. Verticore's team of experts monitor and maintain your private cloud 24 by 7 by 365. Verticore, oh Verticore, you should be using Verticore. Verticore, oh Verticore. You should be using Verticor. Thank you. Thank you very much. See, we still have Mark here in spirit, so that's the important thing. Right, everybody? Right, Dave? Were you singing, Dave? I know that we didn't have a camera on you, but were you singing? I, I was singing along. I had my hat on and everything. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I have, I have joining us Josh Stageberg, Director of Engineering from Live Office. Can you hear us? Yep. Great. Hello. I believe we have to jump into our app of the week. <laughs> All right, Josh, let's jump in here. Uh, we've got Josh joining us from Live Office, and I'm just jumping into the demo here for us. Um, let's get started in here. Now, Josh, um, with Live Office, they're an email archiving compliance and backup solution. Um, you can follow them on Twitter at Live Office. And um, didn't your CEO, Nick Meta, just get Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year? Wasn't he a finalist in that, Josh? He was a finalist, yeah. He almost Great made it. Um, we, were, we were beat out by the, the uh, good folks of eHarmony. E well, still, you know, that's still good accolades for you guys. Um, Absolutely. Now, while I'm logging in here, do you want to give us a little bit of a background about what you've been up to? You've had a lot of momentum lately in terms of announcing you know, record Q2 revenues driven by your partner program. Um, that actually is a point I wanted to make here because we've been talking a lot recently about the cloud and about um, opportunities in the channel. And so it's interesting that, um, what was it, about 60% even um, of, of your revenues were, were for the channel program, is that right? That's right. That's so, right. We, that's, there's a, a convergence of a lot of trends, I think, that are actually working in our favor. Yeah. So obviously, is the adoption of the of the cloud itself. Um, right. But the part, the, our partner program is really um, adding a lot of momentum to everything we're doing. Nice. Um, and you've also just uh, there's also some expansion in EMEA as well. So you've got a new data center. Is it in Amsterdam? I believe. That's correct. So what are you? What is the point there, are you trying to just expand more in EMEA and are you looking to, you know, uh, get, have more partners there or have more customers there in general? What's what's the plan with that? Well, the idea is to get as, get as big as quickly as we can <laughs> and a lot of growth for email archiving isn't obviously just in the U.S. It's, right. It's, it's worldwide. Um, I think the next logical market for us to go uh, was EMEA mm -hmm. and so we're, we're starting there and then um, we'll look at other markets kind of down the road. Gotcha. And so we're primarily going to market there through partners as well and okay. using the partner channel as being kind of our extended sales force. Mm-hmm. All right, hold on just a moment. Um, technical side, guys, uh, um, do you have the, pa we need a password for our um, meeting here. I'm okay, hold on, we're, we're working on that right now. Yeah, so we'll take care of that offline. Um, let's get into a discussion in general just about Live Office. I mean, I want to know a little bit more about the impetus for it. How did you guys come about? You know, Nick um, is the CEO. What was his background? How, how did this, how did Live Office first happen? What was the idea behind it? Um, well, first of all, Amanda, the uh, the password apparently is Live Office One Two Three. <laughs> so, in uh, case anyone wants to join us and go to meeting, there you go. Live Office One Two Three. There we the, go. Um, <laughs> Live Office has been around for about about twelve plus years. Now. Yeah, I was going to say it's and, it's been around for quite a while. So, how yeah, I'm we've been how pretty much a SaaS company or a cloud company ever, ever from our very beginning. Yeah. And so we started off 
um, serving the needs of financial service companies uh, okay. who were largely mandated um, to start archiving their, their email mm-hmm. as a matter of, uh, you know, for, as a business record. Right. As stock trades were being done, email was the way you, you kept track of it. Yeah. Um, and so we had on our, on our side uh, regulatory compliance and the emergence of, of FINRA and other regulations that really mandated that, that financial services companies start archiving all of their, their email. Mm-hmm. And so, but what's happened over, the, especially over the last three years, is email archiving has gone more mainstream. Okay. And, and it, it also kind of parallels the growth of, of email itself. As email has kind of exploded oh, yeah. and gone through the roof, companies kind of all, of all sizes are struggling to kind of um, keep control of their email volumes. I know. I mean, you would think that some people, a lot of people would say that email seems to go down if you're doing social networking and all these other things, but actually it's exploded. So on on that point specifically, you know, what are the benefits, Josh, of putting um, email in the cloud? And and also what are some of the pitfalls that, you know, a lot of people ask you about? Uh, Sure. So I think one of the, typically people are looking at email archiving for a couple of reasons. One Mm -hmm. one is, is so they don't have to manage themselves. Right. Right. So with the explosion of email, you can either keep buying more and more servers to manage that volume, or you can kind of offload it to a trusted partner, and, and that's an important role that we serve. Mm-hmm. Uh, another important reason why they're looking at archiving is um, for legal discovery. So if there's a lawsuit say, between sure. John and Susie, um, the first thing the courts are looking for now is all the email that may be relevant to that lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Well, now, we're seeing that, that with certain tech companies these days, huh? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so let's just say your name is Mark and you work at a large tech company. And if you have to find all the emails from two years ago, for example, and you don't have an easy way to do it, if the emails themselves are, are sitting on tape in some warehouse somewhere right. and they're not necessarily indexed and they're not searchable, it's very difficult for um, for your internal legal team to of actually pull, find those emails and determine whether or not you have a case or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I can see the benefit of this, especially for smaller businesses. You know, some of the companies I've worked with in the past that are smaller, it is that problem of, you know, we've got X amount of server space and everyone, you've got to go in and delete emails because we've reached our maximum capacity here. So I I can see the benefit of that. Um, What are some of the hesitations that you get um, from potential customers that are maybe thinking about moving their email to the cloud? Well, the ones we hear about most often are all typically re- revolve around security, yeah. right, and lack of control. I would so say, yeah, lack of control is big. Yeah, so for bigger companies that are used to having a large IT department where they can see the, the server sitting in that room over there, yeah. there's a comfort level with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, the, you know, the, but the issue is, I mean, for a lot of these companies with the economy, they're all being asked to do more with less. Right. And so it just makes a lot more sense to offload that. Now, the other thing is, is that uh, over the last few years, the cloud providers um, have really beefed up the security on, on the back end and the procedures and the protocols. Mm-hmm. And so in many cases, I mean, we're talking about a multi-million dollar enterprise-grade infrastructure with redundancy and disaster recovery built in. We have, we have that, and most companies, frankly, it would take them a long time to build that kind of infrastructure in place right. if they were trying to do that on premise. Yeah. Well, since we've got, oh, do we have, all right, I was going to say let's jump into the demo, but I'm going to have to reload that again. Um, while, while we're doing that, um, talk a little bit about some of the different migration strategies that you've seen work, um, because I'm sure there are a few different ones. Are, are there some that you recommend the most? Does it depend on the company and what their needs are? And does it depend on, you know, their legacy mailbox data? Like, what, what are some of those migration strategies? Oh, well, it's a great question. So what we find is that companies are either have their email sitting on the exchange, mm-hmm. right, or they're moving their email to a cloud-based um, platform like um, Exchange Online, for example. Right. So it really doesn't matter where your email is kept or what platform you're on. We can archive your email securely um, mm-hmm. from either place. Now, what we typically do as part of the implementation process is we start – journaling right away and journaling is the process that's kind of built with an exchange that essentially securely sends a copy of every email sent or received including the attachment right copies it indexes it and stores it in our archive and we mm-hmm. can do that whether again whether you're on-premise servers or you're using 
um, BPOS or Exchange Online. Yeah. And after we 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 start journaling, so all your email is now flowing through and getting indexed. Um, we then can ingest what we call ingest your legacy data. So all, if you have three mm -hmm. years of email history, we can then index that into the archive. So that oh, that's too becomes. Good. I know personally for me, you know, I've got so many emails that I'll still refer back to in an archive, and, and those legacy messages are the ones that I would be the most concerned about. Yeah, and from an end user, we haven't really talked about it. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about the mailbox quotas. Mm -hmm. and so most companies, in order to keep their exchange humming along, what they'll do is they, they will impose fairly stringent uh, mailbox quotas, like one gig or 500 megs. Right. And what... And the problem then is once you get to that maximum, mm -hmm. right, you have to start deleting emails. Yeah. And it could be emails you don't want to delete. Exactly. But you have a choice because you have to Oops, sorry, code, Mark, right? I have to delete that one. Exactly. <laughs> Internal joke. Exactly. <laughs> so the, the benefit we have with the archive is not just an archive sitting out there in the cloud. What we also do is we have um, Outlook integration. So that right within Outlook, yep. you can click on a folder. You know what? I'm going to jump in just for a second there, Josh, because I've got it pulled up on screen now. So if we jump to the studio laptop, we can start to show some of these things now. Great. Can you see my screen now? Um, I'm in Ashley's. It says viewing Ashley's screen. Okay. Give us one second sure. and we'll hopefully... I saw someone oh, moving around in there a second ago. Okay. There we go. Yeah, someone's moving. <laughs> okay, you, so you're, you can now see kind of our mailbox. So, yep. Um, now this is this is Outlook, right? You can see I'm going to move the cursors. You can see I could kind of expand, and you see my folders and right. Um, and so what we've done with with um, personal archive, and that's what I'm showcasing here, sure. is you're an end user. Now we're actually using the Enron database, uh -huh. so for for uh, demo purposes. But what you see here essentially is your full archive okay. of every email. And I'm logged in here as, for example, as Chris Germany. So pretend I'm Chris Germany for a second. Sure. I can see all the emails that were sent or received from, by Chris. Mm -hmm. Now, what you see over here is, let's suppose I manage a team of 25 people or so. What you're seeing here in the left are all of their mailboxes. Oh, wow. Okay, so I, as a manager, have the ability to not only see my own mailbox, but I can actually have visibility, if the permissions are set appropriately, to view the mailboxes of my own team. Okay. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit deeper. Um, if I were to do a search, I can just type in a word here, and it's going to search across all of my email. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever used the search in Outlook, you'll see that this is actually far superior, because not only is it searching all your, all your email, including all the legacy email, it's also searching across attachments. So, for example, if I typed in um, energy, it does a search, and I'm going to find all the emails related to energy, and let me log back in here. Mm -hmm. Now, one quick thing here, I, I read a stat, I'm not sure if this was a quote specifically from you guys or if this was a bit of research, but up to 70% of IT staff time is spent on maintenance of systems like email. That just floored me, 70% yeah. of IT staff time. Yeah, I mean, it's it just it's getting more and more unwieldy to manage exchange, get, just given the volume of data that we're, we're now talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, everyone's mailbox is getting bigger. The attachments themselves are getting bigger mm -hmm. compared now versus even two years ago. Wow. I, mean, I, I probably get about 200 emails a day. The average attachment size is probably, you know, a, a That's meg. That's true. It's grown as well. Uh-huh. Right. And so there's got to be some system on the back end to help manage that, right? So mm -hmm. what you can do with this is, um, now I've, I've just happened to pull up energy, um, but uh, by but you can essentially impose quotas and, and why while quotas may be um, initially that's kind of a four letter word for the end user if they have access to their own archive right out of Outlook uh -huh. they can delete with impunity right because exactly because what hap by journaling you're capturing the emails in real time so even as soon as I if I get the email I delete it right away it's still sitting in the archive. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I didn't realize that. Right. And okay. so if you're trying to stay within quota, you can literally take all the email from, you know, three months ago and delete it. And if you ever need to find it, you can just click on the personal archive folder in Outlook. It will open up this display, and then you can do a search on it. Oh, that's this, wonderful. This, happened to pull up, this pulled up an email, all the emails related to um, energy. And now I'm just going to, 
I can do more advanced searches if I want to search the subject line or mm -hmm. date range. So you can really drill pattern. down a lot if you would, if you want to. Absolutely. Now what you can also see is after I did this search, these search filters appeared in, in the left nav. Do you mm -hmm. see that? Yep. And so I can narrow this down further and say I, I really only want to see all the emails from 2002. And I just click the search filter and it's going to winnow down the resu results down to a smaller number. Wow. You I can, can definitely then, see how this helps with compliance. Oh, absolutely. And the other thing you can do then is if you, let's say this is the email that you want to actually restore back to your inbox. Mm -hmm. It could, it could be these three emails. I just click the restore button up here. And it, and it switches and, it back over and syncs it. And all those emails I just sent are going to be in my inbox when I get out of personal archive. Nice. And so you quickly, res you can restore an email that you may have lost or deleted from three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With, with two clicks, right? And so um, the other benefit here is you can also tag emails. You can also build in alerts. So, for example, if anyone's sending emails out with profanity, you can put a list of keywords uh, with all, all right. the abusive language you want to put in, and any time that gets sent out, you're notified as a manager. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I, I like that in terms of just the controls that a manager has. Um, another question I had for you, too, is in terms of data recovery models. Um, you know, and, and do you have some that, that you find work best for cloud-based email in terms of archiving? When you see data recovery, mm -hmm. do you mean, for example, if there's a outage on the exchange side, yes. for example? Yes. Yeah, so what, it's interesting you ask that because we also have built within um, personal archive, we have email continuity. Okay. And so what the uh, exchange administrator could do is essentially go to the archive, turn on continuity, mm -hmm. and what that does is it effectively repoints the MX record, and that, that mm. means that users now can access their archive and use that to send and receive email even when their primary email server is down. Wow, okay. That makes me feel more, feel more comfortable. Dave, do you have any th thoughts specifically on what he's been showing us so far? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think ultimately email is the lifeblood of a business these days. We depend on it. I depend on it. Yeah. And this is a this is an excellent way to manage to, to, to manage that asset. I, I got a question for you. What is the elevator pitch in terms of the ROI that this kind of a product brings to a typical enterprise? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, a, a lot of it depends, I think, in the industry they're in. And so um we don't really have a hard and fast kind of ROI, but if, for example, you're in a highly litigious um, industry and you're getting sued, the, the, we can look at the lawsuits, we can look at what it costs you to um, engage a, um, you know, outside counsel to do some of this initial culling of email data, and there we can probably save five to 10x on what you may be paying from like an initial culling of data. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we're measuring here is really productivity gains, um, which will vary from company to company. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we often will compare us with on-premise solutions, and th there we can um, we compete against, and there we kind of have more effective ROI measures. Okay. A social media archiving I saw as part of your offering as well, and it seems like this is the new form of communication. You know, certainly Amanda and I communicate through Twitter, and <laughs> and you know a lot of information is being, okay, so you cut out, being Dave, bantered a bit about. At the very end. Oh, can you repeat that, Dave? You cut out just a little bit at the end. I'm sorry. I saw social media archiving as part of your offering, and that seems to be the wave of the future. Ultimately, as we're communicating via Twitter and communicating well, via Facebook. Um, what we're finding where there's a real need for social media archiving right now seems to be. Um, I'm not going to say isolated, but it seems largely focused in financial services. Hmm. And, and again, it seems like financial services often leads the way because they're so heavily regulated. And what, what's interesting is with financial services is there's some rec recent regulations that essentially, again, once again, effectively mandate that they figure out a way how they're going to start archiving uh, social media like LinkedIn and, and Facebook. And so um, we have a solution that helps them do that both from kind of some of the static content on, on the site as well as more of the dynamic content. Now, I think social media is going to take off and companies are going to look at figuring out a way to archive it, but mo not so much from a, um, a regulatory purpose, but more from a concern about data leak prevention, hmm. more from making sure that their intellectual property isn't being sent out via LinkedIn. 
And so that any employee of a company, they want to make sure that they're following the rules and, and policies of, a, of an organization, which means you don't use LinkedIn or Facebook to share company information, right? And by archiving those communications, you can get a better handle on that. Hmm. Cool. That's actually a very fair point. I, you know, I, I've actually talked with a lot of startups in that space as well in terms of w how do we get a hold, um, you know, control over that social media push that you have a lot of employees uh, doing. Amanda, unfortunately, you're cutting out on my side. Oh, okay. Um, well, in that case, um, let's let's see if um, we can. Can we just test here? Can you hear me now? We'll we'll now do an, we'll do an ad. Well, I think. I think, quite honestly, we've pretty much wrapped it up with that. Um, if you guys would like to learn a little bit more about Live Office, follow them on Twitter, at Live Office. Um, you can also go to um, www.liveoffice.com. Um, Dave, can you still hear me? I can hear you, Amanda. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. Do you have any final thoughts here to wrap things up? No, I, this just looks like a great app, and this is another way to leverage cloud computing that adds a, a nice tactical value within your enterprise. and, and I. I, it was it was great to it was great to see it. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally like the idea of having another place where I can archive all of these emails that are they keep building up on my own system or on the server here. When I'm told, yeah, cut it, cut it, cut them down, cut them down just a little bit. So, all right, well, in that case, many thanks again to our guest previously, James Waters, earlier on the show. You can follow him at Waters James. He's with VMware, and then you know a, a, another shout out finally to Joshua Stageberg with Live Office. You can follow them at Live Office on Twitter, and thank you, Dave, again for joining me from across the country and you know hopefully we'll get you in here in studio and we'll do this live together um, at at the Mahalo studio and here this weekend De um, definitely in, definitely in September I'll be there. <laughs> great September we will have you out here make note of that everyone and of course please thank our amazing sponsors of this week in cloud computing including Verticor actually we need we need to talk about some yeah Vert at Verticor and uh, we have one more one more stormy thing that's going to be happening here. Shield maiden. Yes. Ragnarok is upon us once again. Who's that? Oh, never mind. Just go with it. Okay. Storm, storm on demand. Storm on demand. Storm on demand is an infrastructure as a service, a cloud computing platform that is powerful enough. Powerful enough to replace dedicated servers. A proprietary cloud platform designed by Liquid Web, one of the largest web hosting providers with over 12 years of experience. It is easier to use and less expensive than Amazon EC2. Features include server setup in minutes, easy scaling, backup and restoration capabilities, and pay-as-you-go utility-style billing. Options include cPanel, Fantastico, Ubuntu, Debian, CentOS, fully managed servers, private networking, and swords like this, and little guys that we do not have in this commercial, but it doesn't matter, because this is cooler. Storm On Demand can be found at stormondemand.com. App Storm On Demand. Ragnarok be damned. Storm On Demand. If you do not get Storm On Demand, I will come to your house with my sword and make you get it. <laughs> I love our little guys. Yes, this one's Mark, but Storm On Demand, I love them, at Storm On Demand, at Verticor, and at NetDNACDN. Please send a tweet out. Please thank our sponsors. And, you know, thank Dave, you know, thank our guests, thank everybody, you know, thank at Twe Network. Um, but if you have pitches for our show, send them to pitch at thisweekend.com, amanda at thisweekend.com. If you have conference codes, that sort of thing, please send those to us as well. Um, but be, get, be sure to join us again next Next week we have Evernote coming for App of the Week, and I believe, um, yeah, Evernote, and make sure you check that out. And next time, same same time, same cloud time, same cloud channel. I'm your host, Amanda Kulong, this week in cloud computing. <laughs>